Okay, two really quick notes. One, I got some people commenting on my makeup that they didn't like my dark makeup and all kinds of fabulous opinions from everyone. So what I'm gonna do is turn it into a lesson instead and tell you don't ever conform to people. Don't ever conform to anyone else out of the billion trillion people, however many are on this planet. There is only one of you. So your time here, make it count. Don't aim to please people. Don't conform to what people want you to be. Don't conform to what you think you should be. Conform to who you are. It's as easy as that. And this isn't just about my makeup because I don't really care if people like my makeup or not because my makeup has nothing to do with my paranormal knowledge. But how does this factor into paranormal? I see so many investigators on YouTube and even on television that are trying so hard to be like Zach Bagans. There is only one Zach Bagans. Don't be Zach Bagans, be yourself. Investigate as your own entity and be your own person in general. Don't conform to what you think society wants you to be. Don't conform to what people tell you you should be. Be yourself. And when I say that, some days I wake up and I want to be Barbie. Other days I wake up and I want to be Wednesday Adams. and I don't really care what anybody thinks about it. And you shouldn't either. Second announcement is Jin and David, which are the couple that were featured in the Ogden, Utah episode, apparently Jin is a paranormal investigator. She may have been what, you know, the cause of bringing this energy home to her husband who now has this attachment. Um, and this is thanks to you guys. Like, understand, like, my channel is not ran by myself. Like, just because I deliver this stuff to you guys, like, you guys are the ghost girl army and you guys bring me all of this information, which I love all of you for it. So if any of you have the link to Jen's YouTube channel, can you please link it below in the comments? Um, and then other people can see it. But I just wanted to let you guys know that there might be an actual um, reason why David has this attachment. So this is if Jin brought it home from some investigation and she didn't know how to clear herself after the investigation. So unfortunately, of course, I still feel bad for them because David's going through something really traumatic. But this is also why spiritual warfare should be one of the first things you educate yourself on before you start dabbling with the other side because you can get an attachment and it can be really really serious hey guys what is up welcome back to my channel and it's finally the day right happy halloween so excited to be here and we actually get to talk about the two ghost adventures episodes so this um particular review will be part one of the Halloween special, which was the museum investigation that included Bloody Mary, Lady Snake, Patty from the Black Dahlia episode, and the vampire that was there. Where do I even begin with this? So first of all, a lot of you were asking me about the gypsy cart that you might have seen in the episode. Yes, that is where their resident psychic does her uh, readings. So keep that in mind if you do want to get a reading while you're at the museum, that is where she does her readings. I was actually excited for this episode mainly because you guys were able to see a lot of what I explained of what the museum looks like, right? Like there was a lot more footage and coverage in this episode of them walking around and you could definitely see all the different locations. Um, so you obviously saw the funeral parlor, which is where the really cool stained glass was. You saw the clown area, you saw the fun house, 
you saw um, the art gallery. So you kind of got to see everything I was talking about. You also saw the Ed Gein room, which is where he has fake bodies dangling from the ceiling as if they were hanging from Ed Gein's barn. Also, I wanted to point out, did you notice the music that he was playing in this episode? It was a little bit dark, a little macabre. That is the music that he has playing in the hallways of the museum. Um, so I thought it was really interesting that he crossed that over to the episode of Ghost Adventures that we saw. Also, I picked up that there was circus music playing where the clowns were. So once again, I told you about the museum the senses are alive like there's stuff for your nose for your eyes your sight your hearing your you know it's everything and obviously you're feeling just because the energies are different in each room there was also another shot hopefully you guys recorded it or you can find it online but i noticed a cinematography shot of of the room that i talked about called zach's nightmare so now i feel like i can talk about it because there was actual a visual that you can see there is an area inside of the museum that Zach has built that he claims is his nightmare as a child. And basically what he said he would see was in his dreams, he would walk by this storefront and there would be a bunch of uh, naked mannequins, but they didn't really have a gender, no face, obviously no details. And inside of this storefront, the mannequins were like killing each other, chopping each other apart, they were bleeding cutting each other up, hanging each other, all kinds of really, really gruesome things. And I guess he would be sitting on his dad's shoulders while his dad walked by. And when Zach would look into the storefront and realize that these uh, mannequins would notice him or see him, they would start running after him and his dad and they would start running and running, running, and finally he would wake up in some sort of like a cold sweat because he was trying to get away from these killer mannequins. What is so scary since he's brought it to life is it's so real. I'm not a huge mannequin fan anyway and he has actually brought a real life slaughterhouse of mannequins together inside of the museum. It's on the upper floor. So I'm glad that you can actually see it uh, visually now that um, I feel like I can explain it better now that you're able to see it. Okay, so the very first thing is he brings in Bloody Mary. I really liked Bloody Mary on the episode before from Louisiana or from the South where she worked with Air and I thought she was really great at what she did. So um, doing voodoo isn't something obviously I'm familiar with, but um, I respect what she does. So the very first thing that Zach leads Bloody Mary to is the human skull. So this skull is what I talked to you guys about that I feel... When you're seeing it in person, it, to me it almost doesn't look human. The eye sockets are very large. Um, just the shape of the overall skulls doesn't really seem human to me. And I, I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means ape. I don't know if that means outer worldly. It just doesn't look human the way that it is. I felt like you couldn't really get a good glance at it just on the camera. But when you're in person, you can really distinguish the difference. Now remember, this is the skull that Zach claims has basically ruined all of his relationships. And not only was um, the ovulus saying Norman with Bill Chapel and Billy, but they've actually gotten EVPs inside of the museum claiming that skull, the name of that person is named Norman. So that's just putting two and two together of inside information I know about that I wanted to share with you guys. Apparently after Zach removed that skull from his home, he never had any more poltergeist activity. He was physically pulled out of bed. He claims that that skull was also um, the reason behind him be getting pulled out of bed. And um, he also claims that's maybe why he hasn't had a lot of relationships is because this skull has wrecked havoc on his life. It was new information to me though that the skull had been previously cursed um, or it cursed a family. Once again, I was impressed because the cinematography was really great in this episode, but when you have a place or a location that's not only historic, but also a mansion full of haunted items, I feel like you have to get only good cinematography because there's so much to look at, there's so much to see. Honestly, I've been there twice and I feel like I still haven't seen everything, which is why I'm so willing to go back over and over. There was a cinematography shot, um, it was just B-roll, where they had an actress come in and like walk backwards, kind of weird, up the stairs from the basement, which is what Zach calls the portal to hell or the gateway to hell. And they just had this actress look really creepy for the B-roll and I was just so impressed by it. I really enjoyed that um, little snippet because I just feel like when you get something that seems like it's authentic to the spirit world, it really makes you feel like you're there with them and I really love 
that kind of cinematography even though that's not technically documentary that's that would be what you would consider being directed by like a director of photography but it's still amazing because it was planned there's an actress involved but it, it still looked really great so Zach rushes to the door and the very first person that comes in is Father Sebastian and Father Sebastian is an occult vampire um, and he brings in his consort Isabella um, do you guys know what a consort is? Like, maybe some people know, maybe some people don't, but I just felt like it's time for Crystal's lessons again on paranormal vocabulary. I am going to reveal something that is fairly strange, and I do not want to be judged for it. At one time, I had a distant cousin who was practicing being a vampire, so he not only would take par in the place of drinking human blood, but he would also drink animal blood. When I say that, they don't sacrifice animals. They'll go to like a butcher's shop and get blood. Not that that's any better, especially you guys know how much of an animal activist I am. I don't think it's not only just weird, but not sanitary. I'm not really sure. Anyway, this consort, um, in case you're not aware of what one is, technically you could just bare bones say that they're a sex slave, meaning that usually vampires will feed off of their consort um, during that particular time of the day. The first thing that Father Sebastian says is, I brought my consort, Isabella, she go, she travels with me when I travel. Usually they have two people that they feed off of, um, and a responsible vampire <laughs> will get everyone checked in their, I don't know if it's a coven, I don't, I don't know. And they will get them checked for HIV and AIDS every three months to make sure that, I guess, everyone's playing with a full deck for vampires. I'm assuming that Father Sebastian had Isabel, Isabella, whatever her name was, there in case he just got hungry and needed a snack. I'm not really sure. The only thing I was excited about Father Sebastian was hearing that he's an occult specialist, hoping that he was going to stir something up with what he knows. So obviously the first place that Zach is going to send um, a vampire is to the vampire's mirror, uh, which is Bella Lugosi's mirror. So this mirror was basically the last witness to an actual murder that took place. It's also claimed that there was scrying that was done you know, within the mirror itself, which is why this mirror is so dark and it, it happens to be harboring a demon. So before I go any further, I do want to just state one thing is like I've been in the museum twice now um, and I've been in uh, the art gallery. I think I've mentioned um, that something in there doesn't make me feel right, but it's not like Ed Gein's room, but I don't know if I admitted this to you guys or not. I've actually not looked in Bella Lugosi's mirror. I don't know what it is. It's like a gut instinct tells me not to when I've been there. So, as odd as it sounds, I have not looked in Bella Lugosi's mirror. So, um, I know I'm going on Halloween. I'm not sure if that will change or not, but I just thought that would be a fun fact to tell you guys of, I just have had no desire to do it. I don't know if I'm afraid. I don't know if I'm uncomfortable. I just, I just haven't, I haven't done it. So I just wanted to talk about scrying really quick. There's several ways to do it. I feel like scrying is a lot like smudging, even though they're different. I'm just saying like there's a thousand ways to smudge and I feel like there's a thousand ways to scry. So um, you know, even if I talk about it, that doesn't mean it's the right way. That doesn't mean that's the way that it will work for you. Um, I feel like a lot of stuff in this industry, you just kind of have to play around with it until you find something that works for you. So there's one way to do it with wax. You can drip um, hot wax into water, and then when you look into the surface of the water and the wax, um, sometimes while it's still drying, sometimes after it's dried, um, you can see words form. You basically have to almost meditate or try to um, mentally connect yourself with the other side by asking questions. You can ask out loud or just in your head. Um, but basically, it's like a meditation of, um, of practice, of trying to get a message through 
you know, different ways of scrying. Another way to do it is through a mirror. So that's the most popular way to do it. So what you do is you kind of relax and you stand in front of the mirror, you relax your vision, you relax your mind, and then you become kind of focused. So it's once again, meditating with your eyes open is the only way I can explain it. So what you do is you start staring into the mirror and eventually when you start either asking um, questions out loud or in your head, you should be able to see images and shapes and words and possibly entities, bad or good, in the mirror and they will communicate with you. A lot of people claim they see light anomalies. Uh, sometimes the message isn't for you, sometimes it's for someone else. So you just kind of have to keep an open mind about it. There's another way you can scry that I've heard of, which is you take a clear plate, like go to the dollar store and find like a clear glass plate, dinner plate, and it has to be glass. And then you buy matte black um, spray paint. And you have to spray it both sides like five to eight times to make sure that it's like completely dense. You can't see anything through it. And um, you can like kind of decorate the outer edges. And once it's like that matte black and it needs to be very smooth, no bubbles from the paint, then you can once again scry holding up this plate and ask questions into it and once again you should see images, pictures, whatever, all kinds of different things coming through the plate that you're scrying on. Okay, so now we have Lady Snake who's from the Hellfire Caves episode. So this was probably to me the most interesting part of the night. In fact, you might wanna re-watch it so you know what I'm talking about. There is a point that Lady Snake walks in and she doesn't really greet Zack she immediately looks at Zach and she's like, you've done what she wants, you've dabbled in the dark, you've dabbled in the occult, you've dabbled with demons, she's right where you want you, like all kinds of weird stuff, talking about she, she, she. There has been a claim um, that's been surfaced for years that Zach has a really bad attachment from Bobby Mackey's. This claim is widely known in the paranormal community, maybe more so in the celebrity community. And I've gotten to hang out with a lot of celebrity events and stuff, so maybe that's why I know and I'm more knowledgeable about it. But it's kind of just a fact that everyone knows Zach has this dark um, female attachment. More often than not, Zach will be at an event and psychics will walk up to him that he doesn't know, people that he's never met, and they will say, you know, you have this um, female attached to you. She presents herself as a female, but she's actually demonic. She's dark. And a lot of times these psychics have told him that it sits right on his back, like on his shoulder. So it's smaller. So it's like a little demon that just sits on him. This claim makes him really mad. I've actually witnessed, um, I think it was at Scarefest or maybe it was at the Stanley Hotel. Uh, at one of those events, he had, someone had walked up to him and I witnessed him get like livid, like very angry. This attachment supposedly came from Bobby Mackey's. So this attachment, not only is the skull supposedly responsible for his relationships ending, but so is this female. And to be perfectly honest, why I'm open about talking with you guys is if you listen to his album Necrofusion, there is a female on there a lot that are through the EVPs and then he DJ'd behind it. And the EVPs of the female voice are supposedly this attachment that he has. Apparently this female attachment is very um, controlling of him, possessive of him, and um, another reason why he hasn't had the most success with relationships in the past. He is very protective of her as far as I know. He doesn't talk about it publicly, and um, I think that it's probably at a point where it might be some sort of an oppression stage, where it's a um, codependent feeling, where he functions with her or it, and then it functions with him. I'm open talking about this because Lady Snake walked in and like immediately addressed it, and I don't. I'm shocked that he he aired it on national television since he's so private about that, but he did. And so I just thought I would kind of fill in the blanks for you guys so you would know what she was talking about. Um, it's not like it's a secret. It's just not, I don't know if it's as widely known outside of the 
celebrity paranormal community, you know, as it is within that actual community. And I think I even have a quote that I wrote down that Lady Snake said to Zach, she's given you what you want. So I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means he wants to be surrounded in his museum with dark things. I don't know what that means. Okay, so let's move forward. So Lady Snake is going to be put in Ed Gein's room. I'm so glad you guys got to see Ed Gein's room. Um, I hope you're excited because at least you got to see big chunks of um, the museum for those of you that can't go to the museum. Now at least you know what it looks like. So Ed Gein's room is really cool, like I said. Um, the cauldron is in the middle. And then Jay noted that he had this horrible nightmare the night before of a demon peeling his skin off, which is just really horrific, right? One part that made me nervous was when Jay was discussing, yes, my back, you know, I had this dream. And then Lady Snake was like, well, good, can you give blood, you know, if I decide to do a spell or conjure something in the, in the cauldron later? And I was like, I hope he didn't. Because they never confirmed if Jay participated, but did you notice he wasn't there for the next episode, really? He wasn't involved. So I don't know, I hope he didn't, um, but who knows what happened. So then he brings in Patty. Patty's the lady from the Black Dahlia episode. She's the White Witch, and they put her in the gypsy wagon to sit and basically um, spit out what she was feeling or sensing or seeing from images from her intuition, um, intuitive powers. Dakota is the new camera tech that they hired. Um, he said that he was scared he, um, and he ended up with scratches, which we'll talk about that later. And then last, Bloody Mary comes in um, from the Voodoo Queen and she goes to the basement and she starts doing this really big ritual, okay? So first, Lady Snake goes in the room with Jay to basically conjure something in this big cauldron, which I'm shocked that Jay would even be willing to participate, but that's none of my business. Whatever she did wasn't good. I'm gonna say that because I've been in there twice and the tour guides warn people not to touch the cauldron because of Lady Snake. They literally specifically will say, don't touch the cauldron because of what Lady Snake did. Basically, there's a concern behind the cauldron that whatever she conjured is now permanently a part of that. So if you touch the cauldron, it will also become attached to you. They did not show even more information, insider information that I know, which is, I don't know if Jay actually gave blood to disperse in this whatever ritual they did, but I know Lady Snake did. And once again, the tour guides talk about it and they say Lady Snake's blood is in there. Basically, Lady Snake did a ritual behind Zack's back um, to summon in Ed Gein and his demons or whatever. So um, maybe that's why I don't like that room. I just don't like the feeling in that room in general. So Patty is like awesome. She's sitting in the gypsy wagon and she's like on top of it. Like she's pulling out everything from Lady Snake, from Bloody Mary. Um, she's got it down to a system. So now we're back on footage of Father Sebastian, the vampire, who is basically half provoking, saying that whatever is in the mirror, he's gonna go in and pull it out. It's never really confirmed if he's actually scrying. No one really knows what he's doing other than like pacing and looking in the mirror. Suddenly it cuts back to Patty saying she sees a woman laying on the ground, which is Bloody Mary in the basement. <laughs> Billy walks in and I, I love Billy's attitude with everything. Like I feel like he's, he's not new obviously, but I feel like he still gets shocked by things, you know? And like Billy walks in and he's like, he sees Bloody Mary on the floor, are you okay? She's like, yeah, you know, spiritual energy um, sometimes gets to you quicker while you're lying down. And she's like really serious. And Billy's like, is it working? <laughs> it's like, oh my God. Like, I just, I really love Billy. Like, he is really my favorite gross adventure just because I feel like he gets in some of the weirdest situations and he has to kind of cope with. Thought it was really strange that Bloody Mary starts cuddling up with that doll. Um, that is one of Zach's most haunted dolls. He keeps it in a locked case that you cannot touch. You can't get to it. Um, and creepy. And like Zach thinks there is a serious demonic attachment to it. So that even proves to you guys that someone who is like the voodoo queen, Bloody Mary, who is psychic, still cannot sense that it is a demon versus a child. 
I haven't been near that doll. Bloody Mary did say something about like innocent till proven guilty. Yes, probably you should be that way in the human world, but probably not in the spiritual world. You need to be very skeptical in the spiritual world because there's a lot of deceiving energies out there that are not authentic and that are trying to play you. And really, I think there's a lot of soul collectors out there, not just for the spirit side of souls, but also human souls, like when they attach to human souls. So just be very weary of that. Like even someone as experienced as Bloody Mary couldn't distinguish the difference between dealing with a child, which she was willing to give a tea set to, versus dealing with something that could be much darker and deceiving her to be a child. And also remember Patty says, it's going from a human spirit to a child spirit and all she says, it's a dead spirit and it's not good. So even Patty, the good witch, the white witch, was picking up on it being dark. Now we're back in the room with Isabella and her partner, Father Sebastian. So first I automatically saw Isabella like separated herself from Father Sebastian. Like she was not feeling right, something was going on. So she knew to take a step back. So she was literally as far back as she could be in that room. And then this is when Sebastian's staring in the mirror and blacks out. I did see he didn't try to brace himself. He did hit so hard that his feet flew up into the air. I saw the light anomaly. So now it's time, I suppose, for me to interject my opinion. I don't know if I can roll my eyes back any further than this. Oh, if I roll them anymore, my eyeball is going to roll across the floor like for real. Oh. First of all, I mean, I know it's Halloween and all, but I just feel like ghosts are enough and like witches. I don't know why we have to bring in vampires. And if we're bringing in the vampires, then someone tell me where Jacob the werewolf is. I don't know, you guys. Like, I, I, I get that he fell, like, and I believe that that was a real fall, or he would have at least braced himself. Even if he would have been faking it at the last minute, he still would have braced himself, and he didn't. So I do think that he, like, blacked out. And I thought it was really creepy how he, like, turned to Isabella and then turned back to the mirror. That was really strange. I have respect for people and whatever that they do, like... I think that vampire, vampiric stuff is gross. Like when you're talking about real life people drinking human blood. Like I can't stand the smell of blood. Like if you get an IV, I can smell like that. Like iodine, like almost salty smell. I hate the smell of blood, let alone to think about drinking it. Like makes me want to vom or animal blood for that matter. I respect that that's his like genre and that's his thing but gross and I'm not interested in it. And the only other thing, you know, he said he's gonna get in that mirror and pull it out, he's provoking. And, you know, I've dealt with demonic stuff before. I, I feel like I have witnessed possession. Personally, I know what the other realm on the dark side is capable of, it's very strong. So you wouldn't get me a seasoned investigator going in to provoke a demon, like I would never do that. So I'm gonna be honest and say that I found it rather comical that you have this like, um, I don't know, he looks like he stepped out of like the 1970s like with his little hat and his little jacket. And you have this like big badass vampire coming in with his with his consult constant I don't know what that was. And he's gonna go in and he's gonna provoke a demon. And I was amused because the demon was like, What now? What now, you stupid vampire? Like the demon's like, You wanna you wanna challenge me? Like he literally knocked him down. So to be honest, I'm cheering on the demon. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's right. You show him what's up because it's like, um, don't provoke. Like, I guess don't provoke if you don't know the consequences of what could happen to you. I know it was really good action for Ghost Adventures, but I think that what he did was really stupid and arrogant and ignorant. And honestly, he could have ended up like getting a concussion. Like the night we watched this, we had, Blake was there, he was a medic. Um, he was in the med he was in the army for six years. He's a medic. And then we had a bunch of our other friends, and everyone was like, he could have got a concussion. 
Like, he could have been seriously injured. And why didn't they have a medic on set? Like, they have a lot of people this time, a lot of things going on. Where? Why didn't they have a medic on standby? Like, of course there could be an emergency, you know? All I'm saying about Father Sebastian is he probably got what he was, you know, wishing. He probably got what he was looking for. Um, you talk shit to a demon, you get what you, you get what you ask for. That's all I'm going to say. Can I just also say one more thing? Like, I did provoke on set of Paranormal Challenge to try to get more evidence, which we won. So, I, so I'm grateful for that. But I'm not a provoker. I'm not a provoker, but I get some of the best evidence when I'm investigating. I don't even have to provoke. So I don't know if it's my energy and, like, how attuned I am to the spiritual side. But I, I'm tired of this example being set of, like, you have to provoke in order to get, um, you know, evidence. That's not true. That's not true. In fact, I feel like sometimes I've gotten even better evidence than what I've seen on TV. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. So after Sebastian falls, Zach gets him up. They walk outside. Um, and then Zach goes in and he starts screaming at the Bella Lugosi mirror saying, What are you? Let me feel what you did to Sebastian. There's two things that could have been. Either Zach was extremely jealous that Father Sebastian got injured and he didn't because Zach loves to have the injuries on him or the big attacks happen on him and so there could have been a jealousy issue or it was just really over overly dramatized like I love ghost adventures don't get me wrong but when I saw him screaming in that mirror I was like it didn't feel like a realistic um it just didn't feel realistic to me to be honest like I would have been more concerned you know for the injury of my friend but we've seen a pattern with Zach where like that hasn't been his priority is the injuries of his team. So maybe it's not his priority. But I don't know if, like what screaming does, you know, to the mirror. Like I know he saw like an anomaly and like he screamed and saw something, but I just thought it was really over dramatic and I thought it was like over the top. I found it frustrating because I felt like there was enough going on, like Bloody Mary, Lady Snake, Patty the White Witch, Jay's having nightmares, there's the freaking consort with her vampire in there who's she's his feeder like I don't know what's going on right now they called it the museum of madness it was more like a fun house I have no idea what's happening I just felt like the show had too much going on there was too much going on there was not enough investigating there wasn't really tons of evidence um, it was like a it was like a weird freak show instead like I didn't know what was happening I would have been more interested in watching the witches um, do conjuring or whatever then I would have seen like the vampire like I really don't get his position I don't get what he was there for I don't get like was he scrying like nothing was clear and then he wasn't there for very long and there was such a huge chunk taken out of time on him because he passed out and because Zach provoked the mirror so I don't know it just like it, I was a little bit annoyed I guess is the only way to describe it I just felt like it started to veer off into like a dramatic episode of Vampire Diaries. Like if you've ever seen Vampire Diaries, which I'm a really big fan of the series, but it's a scripted series for a reason. Like there's vampires and werewolves and ghosts and witches. And I just feel like that's where we were going. It was like, what is happening here? Like there's too many subplots and I can't focus on one thing. And like there wasn't enough time focused on different characters. I just felt like maybe it would have been better if it was like a two hour special and then we could have focused more on what was actually happening with each person inside of the rooms. All I'm gonna say, all I'm gonna say is, I like the witches more than watching the sex slave and her vampy man. That's all I'm gonna say. So Dakota was the hired, you know, camera tech. So all of a sudden, you know, he had, at the beginning of the show said, oh, I'm scared, blah, blah, blah. And then he has all these scratches up and down his neck. I'm trying to play the devil's advocate, but I've been in paranormal for a really long time. And so I've seen people get injured. I've gotten injured. I've gotten scratched. I've gotten cut. I've gotten all kinds of things. Um, but I will say that his injuries to me looked very man-made and... I'm not saying that indefinitely that's, you know, the case, but I've seen scratches where I've had investigators fake scratches. I've seen um, scratches where they've actually been injuries from the other side and they were so defined. I've never seen scratches that defined. 
So I have concerns that um, it may have been man-made. I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of scratches both both from the other side of man-made and it just didn't seem legit to me. That's all I'm gonna say. Lady Snake is in Ed Gein's room conjuring something and Zack has a really bright idea to take the White Witch in there to shock her. It's for the shock value of it. So Lady Snake is the Black Witch or I don't know if you want to call her satanic or if you want to say black magic I don't know like there's so many different layers of a dark witch that I don't know which one she is but obviously Patty is a good witch which means she obviously practices Wicca so she doesn't believe in harming or hurting other people the minute the white witch walks in with Lady Snake Lady Snake says she wants to hit her on the head and put her in the cauldron First of all, if I were Zach, I would have been like, hold up a second, that was not appropriate. Please apologize. You can't talk to people like my guests like that. But that's just me. The White Witch called out the Black Witch basically saying, you're not only conjuring things, you're not keeping it in the pot like you're telling everyone you are. Um, you know, like the, the darkness is alive and well in here. I didn't agree on one side with this because I have friends that practice White Witchcraft and Wicca. And I've talked about this before, so I'm actually really glad that I had those videos available to you guys educating you on witchcraft so that you knew exactly what was going on here. And I've said this before, white witches don't want anything to do with black witches. Like they think they have not only disrespected the religion of Wicca, but their powers and like, cause they've kind of taken their powers for good and turned them bad. So white witches don't want anything to do with dark witches because they can't believe that they're harming things and people or whatever, you know, for selfish purposes. So on that side of it, I didn't agree with putting them in the room because that's like putting a real life source of evil and good together and you don't know what's going to happen. On the other side of it, I was actually glad that he did because we were able to physically see for probably the first time ever, other than X-Men, which doesn't really count, what happens when you get good versus evil in a room. And did you notice that the black witch got intimidated by the white witch? She started to back up, she was back in the corner, she started kind of like yelling at her, telling her to get out. She was going to hit her on the head, put her in the cauldron, like out of all of these defense mechanisms. And the white witch is like, oh, really? And she's smiling and laughing and she's like kind of just calling her out on her stuff. She didn't threaten her back. She didn't do any of the things the dark witch did. Let's apply this lesson to life and <laughs> talk about the good witch versus the bad witch. Seriously, the bad witch was yelling, was inferior to her. So seriously, take this as... Trolls online, mean people in your life, nasty ex-boyfriends, girlfriends, ex-wives, ex-husbands. The bad is always intimidated or inferior to the good. Seriously. The good was like, oh, ha, 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 what are you doing? Well, that's ridiculous. You shouldn't be doing that. So just remember that evil never prevails over good. It doesn't. And we could see this. We could see this happening. Even though Patty wasn't in the room she had been placed in originally, Patty was placed in the evil witch's room. She was like floating around like freaking Glinda the Good Witch, <laughs> like all around the room like, well, what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing that. Shame on you. And it made the other girl very intimidated. So seriously, apply this to life. Literally when they say, the bad will never take over the good. This was a visible example of that. The bad will never prevail over, over the good, ever. Patty literally said, you can't keep it in the cauldron, can you? You didn't, did you? And then the bad witch was like, you can't keep everything in the cauldron, of course. Zach taking him in there, like I agree and disagree in it, but it was really an antagonist moment for him, like as his character to bring these two together and potentially cause like spiritual warfare on one another. Um, so for that instance and for that case, I didn't really agree with it. And I also didn't agree with him standing up to the Dark Witch saying, please don't do that. You know, it's not appropriate. That was the end of the episode. There was hardly any, um, I don't know, what happened to just ghost hunting? Like, what happened to just ghost hunting? Like, I understand they wanted to raise the bar and do all this stuff, and, like, I get that, but, like, what happened to just ghost hunting? Like, why can't we just strip it back down to, like, just ghost hunting? 
Like, I'm totally fine with the witches and stuff. Like, there was some cool stuff going on. I felt like uh, maybe they needed to be led in different directions if they weren't getting good evidence. But I don't know. Like, I don't, I just didn't get the vampires thing. Like, I didn't get it. I didn't get the episode, to be honest. It wasn't bad. It wasn't their best. I was left kind of like... What did you guys think of this episode? Did you like it? Did you not like it? Are you an Edward fan? Are you a Jacob fan? <laughs> Just kidding. No, but for real, did you like anything about this? Did you dislike anything about this? Happy Halloween, guys. Make sure you give my video a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Make sure you guys follow me on social media, and I will catch you guys in the next review. Oh, yeah. I'm the